I thought it would take some time to explain two very important aspects to ancient Rome, and that is Imperium and Pomerium. And they kind of go hand in hand, so that is why I've included both of these topics in this lecture. Now first, let's talk about Imperium. Imperium translates literally to the power to command. And this basically gave an individual the power to command a legion or army. The first Roman kings were granted imperium. After the republic was established, imperium was granted to the consuls and, if need be, a dictator. It was also granted to military tribunes. Now, early on, that worked just fine. But as the republic grew in size and added province after province, it wasn't practical to grant imperium just to the consuls and tribunes. And if you think about it, the Republic had garrisons and troops all over the place, in some very remote places. So again, it just wasn't practical. Therefore, Imperium was also granted to governors and proconsuls as well, and they could then issue orders to the legions. Now, Imperium was usually assigned to a specific region. So for instance, let's say you were a proconsul and you were assigned the province of Spain, and you were given a term of three years. Therefore, you would be granted Imperium for Spain only. Now let's say you decided to take a trip from Spain to Gaul. Well then you would lose your Imperium once you entered Gaul. You wouldn't have any right to issue orders to any legions inside Gaul because you had been granted Imperium for Spain only. And that's actually the law that Julius Caesar broke when he crossed the river Rubicon. He had been originally granted Imperium for Gaul, but not Italy. And so when he crossed the Rubicon, that is the law he broke because again he was not assigned Imperium for Italy. Now, Roman consuls generally had imperium everywhere. So let's say a Roman consul was situated in Syria and he decided to enter into Egypt. He could then still issue orders to the legions inside Egypt. In addition, a Roman consul had absolute authority over everyone else with imperium except for the other Roman consul. Remember, there were always two Roman consuls elected during the Republic. Now, if two Roman consuls happened to be in the same vicinity, they would rotate the command on a daily basis. One final thing I want to mention is the difference between delegated and possessed imperium. Let's say a consul was required to return to Rome and needed to leave someone in charge. The consul could delegate imperium to his deputy. The deputy could then take command of the legion. Possessed imperium, however, was more powerful than delegated imperium. So how does Pomerium come into play? Well, Pomerium was the religious boundary around the city of Rome, and you can see that in this diagram right here. It's actually shaded in dark red. So legally, Rome only existed inside this boundary. Everything on the outside was something else, and that something else was referred to as Ager. But again, Rome itself only existed within this boundary. According to legend, it was Romulus who originally laid down this boundary. Later on, it was expanded out by Sulla. Since this area was considered sacred, weapons were strictly prohibited. So how does this relate to Imperium? Well, if you were a Roman general or governor, and you wanted to go inside the Pomerium, you were required by law to stand down. So basically, you had to resign your Imperium. Roman consuls, however, were exempt from this law. They still held their imperium, but their powers were greatly reduced. And actually, there's an interesting aspect to this in Roman history. During the alliance between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, Pompey did not want to leave Italy, but he still wanted to retain command over his legions. So that meant he could not go inside Rome, or he would have been forced to resign his imperium. And Pompey didn't want the consulship either, because he didn't want to be troubled with the day-to-day -day activities of the consular office. So to get around this, he decided to stay at a very nice, plush villa just outside of Rome. This allowed Pompey to keep his imperium in case he needed to issue orders to his legions. Okay, so let's talk about imperium rankings. A dictator's imperium was supreme over all other magistrates. This also meant a dictator was attended by the highest amount of lictors, 24. The lictor's main duty was to serve as bodyguards to the magistrates who held imperium. They were easily identified by the fasces they carried. These were essentially a bundle of wooden rods, which often included an axe. The fasces symbolized the power of the magistrate. The axe itself symbolized the power to carry out capital punishment. The lictors were not permitted to carry these rods inside the pomerium. In addition, the dictator was only permitted to bring 12 lictors inside the pomerium. The other 12 had to remain on the outside. Next came the consuls, who were attended by 12 lictors. The consul's imperium was supreme over all other magistrates, unless a dictator was elected during a time of crisis. Below a consul's imperium was the praetor. He was attended by six lictors, of only which two were allowed inside the pomerium. One final note, any individual who held imperium was entitled to sit on a curial chair, which you can see in this diagram. 